software engineer at Clue. Uh, and uh, let's listen to his interesting presentation about Kotlin language. Thank you. Okay, hello. Um, so today we're going to be talking about Kotlin. Um, actually, how many here have used Kotlin before? Just to pretty much everyone, okay? So how many of you would describe themselves as beginners? <laughs> Intermediate? Oh, always, yeah. Advanced? Okay, so intermediate is, yes. I'll try to make it a bit more dynamic. If you have questions during the presentation, ask, and I'll try to answer. Um, so the title of this talk is More Than an Island, with the fancy animations. Uh, the reason why this is, is uh, well, first of all, Colin, like Java, is an actual island, so that's one, uh, one side of it, but also there's much more to it than what it looks like. So. When you hear about Kotlin, it's often described as um, a new JVM language. Now, there's at least two things that are not exactly correct in this statement. First, that it's new. It's not. Uh, it was first announced in 2011, which is uh, six years ago. Uh, as a comparison, Android was released nine years ago, so not that far. And uh, the 1.0 hit in 2016, uh, which is last year. And we already have 1.1, and 1.2 is being developed, so like, they're moving really fast, and it's not new. Uh, the second thing is that it's a JVM language. Now, it is also a JVM language, and I don't want to spoil too much, but let's say that Kotlin comes in many flavors. <laughs> this is for you, much. Okay. Um, uh, also, yeah, one of the reasons, maybe the reason why Kotlin is so popular right now is obviously Google because this happened. Uh, yeah, so for the first time, I think, ever, uh, Google finally added one extra officially supported language to Android, which is Kotlin. And this made it so that if you really wanted to use, your, uh, to use Kotlin in your app, now you finally have a business case for it. And uh, it's really exploding. Like The popularity of Kotlin just skyrocketed after that. OK, welcome, new people. Uh, yeah, so actually what is Kotlin and what really is Kotlin? Because I think a bit of context and history really help in this case. So it was made by JetBrains, which you probably know. They make tools, they make uh, IntelliJ IDEA, uh, uh, which is a base for Android Studio. And they essentially, they didn't want to create a language in the first place. They were, they, they hit the limit of what Java could do for them because they have millions of lines of code in production and it's not scaling very well. So they wanted to find a solution that would make them more productive and make them able to maintain this huge code base without too much pain. And so they evaluated different options and in the end, the, they came to the conclusion that writing a new language was the only way. Uh, also, fun fact, when they contacted uh, Andre Breslav, the creator of the language, at the beginning he was like, no, why should I create a new language? Like, it really doesn't make any sense. And when they explained all the use cases, in the end he was convinced and said, okay, fine, let's try. Um, so like one nice side effect of this is that the, the interoperability with Java comes from the use case of having to maintain this huge code base. So that's why they made it, right? Uh, it's open source, which is great. Um, mostly because it's completely transparent what's happening. Um, you can always fix it yourself if you want, if there's any issues. And uh, with the deal with Google, it's going to be a uh, non-profit foundation, which is amazing because they won't make another Oracle incident happen again. Uh, and if your business is, if, if you want to base your business on a technology such as Kotlin, you definitely want something neutral that cannot be controlled, right? Um, yeah, so, and Kotlin is pragmatic, it's often described this way, because it doesn't come from like an academic world, like it was made for a specific use case, uh, which is used every day, and that's what it is, right? It's essentially effective Java baked into the language. And uh, it's safe, or at least safer than Java, in the sense that uh, it prevents you from shooting yourself in the foot in many different ways, or at least encourages you to, to use best practices in ways that Java just doesn't. Uh, also, super important, it has magic, and there's different kinds of magic. So there's like bad magic, like good examples, I think, are uh, Groovy or Scala or Ruby, where they allow you to do anything, but then 
when you don't know what's going on, to find out what really is going on is really hard. Uh, with Kotlin, we have good magic in the sense that whatever is happening there, you can always step in. You can always actually see really what's going on, the generated code, etc. Uh, so it's it's a different approach to to magic essentially. Uh, and last but not least. And this is something weird to explain, but uh, it's something that can be really measured. But people, when they get in contact with Kotlin, they just say it's fun. Like it brings them joy in ways that I haven't seen before. Um, and it also means that it's functional because the, it allows you to have this style where it's a bit more functional than usual. And that's really useful in many ways. We'll see more later. OK, so uh, I'll ask again. But how many of you are beginners in Kotlin? <laughs> how many are intermediates? Experts? OK. And those that didn't raise their hands? I don't know. <laughs> Just IOS. <laughs> IOS people, yeah. OK, so uh, I'll quickly go through some syntax usages, but very briefly, because I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. But mostly, I'll explain why it makes sense to use these features while, while using Kotlin. So uh, packages are the first thing that shows the freedom of Kotlin. Uh, they're optional, first of all, which is probably something you don't want to do, because uh, you might encounter clashes in signatures if you don't have packages. So maybe use them. Uh, they do not need to match a folder. So that's actually really useful. Um, I had the case uh, a week ago where I was integrating Google Fit API on Android. And obviously, Google decided to hide a method in the play services. So it wasn't accessible, but it was package protected. So the usual way to expose it is to create a file in that package that exposes the method, and then you can use it. And normally, you would have to put this in a completely different folder structure, right? In, in the original package of Google Fit. What I did here, I created a very nice file called uh, Google Fit Hacks with the Google Fit package that exposes the method, but it resides in the same folder where I have all the different, all the same files for my feature, right? So if in the future uh, we want to delete that feature, it's all in one place. I don't have to go and look around for fragmentation of pieces of files and, and logic. So that's really useful, actually. And you should do it if it makes sense for your use case, because it's really helpful. Uh, files are also very open in many ways. So you can have multiple classes per file. And that's great, because sometimes um, imagine you have uh, 100 different cases encoded in 100 different classes. If this was Java, you would open the package, and you would literally see 100 files. And that can be quite overwhelming. In Kotlin, that could be one file with 100 lines, because often your class can be a single line. And so, of course, you have this logical unit in one place. You see what's going on. Of course, like use it responsibly, but yeah, you, you get gist. Um, and so, yeah, this is also really, really useful for readability, for maintainability, and to to make it clear to people um, what you're talking about. Like, this is my unit of work, and not like this. Uh, and you can have top-level functions. Well, and extensions, and we'll see that later. But this is not just to avoid the boilerplate. It's not about the laziness of not having or not wanting to write a wrapper class. It's because by having top-level functions, you can actually make them discoverable. So this really is a shift in how you you explore new APIs. So instead of having to guess what kind of util wrapper you need to check to invoke that method, you just start writing the name. And magically, it appears if you're in the right context, of course. Um, and this is really something that is often like overlooked because it really does change the way you onboard new people to the code base, the way you work with the code base. Um, yeah. And again, we'll see more examples of that later. Uh, let's see some code. This is the most basic hello world example you can imagine. The types are on the other side. Get used to it. Blah blah blah. Uh, it's similar to Swift, if you know that. Uh, you can make things immutable locally by declaring them as val. Of course, it, this is complaining because they're immutable. Uh, if you want to modify that, you make them mutable. And the IDE is being, being very passive aggressive and telling you that this is different. Like, it's telling you, like, are you really sure that this is what you want to do? Uh, it's like hinting subtly that things might actually be different. And so, Again, it's one of the many small details 
uh, that the Kotlin team has embedded into the language where they are gently pushing you into a direction that actually makes your code and your mindset a lot better when developing software. Um, it's uh, Actually, it shifts your style in a way so that you tend to encapsulate stuff much more, and you have this chaining of things that eventually return a single value, which is the only real value you care about. You don't care about what happens before. Um, and again, by doing this sort of encapsulation piece by piece, you, you end up having much cleaner code, uh, much more sound code, because all the modifications are local to, to your small scope where things happen. Yes, and then of course, nullability. This is like one of the best features of Kotlin. Uh, I would say that Kotlin made nulls great again because before using nulls was really an anti-pattern in many ways. Uh, now with Kotlin, it's actually nice and encouraged to use nulls as, as an optional value. So either you have a value or it's null, which is fine. E, uh, yeah, and they have this super nice syntax for handling it, so you declare a nullable type. You have this LDIS operator to, to provide something else, and you can chain them as many as you want. So you can say this if it's null, that if it's null, that. And something else that is super interesting is that they, they are expressions, so they don't have to be values. You could do something like this value, Elvis operator, throw an error, because that's an expression. So you can literally say, don't go to the next line if this is null, or return from the function if this is null, without having any if. You just say value, Elvis, something. Um, you can, of course, uh, decompose stuff um, if they're null, so like nullable, question mark dot length means if nullable is null, return null for the entire expression, otherwise step in. And you can, again, chain that as much as you want. Uh, and in the end, you see, I don't know if you can see the color, yeah, the, the smart cast that happens. So if you check that something is not nullable and it's immutable, it will automatically be smart casted as not nullable. And so that's amazing because you don't have to check anymore, your code is safe completely in that sense. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then we have extensions, which are great. Uh, again, this is not just about the beauty of having, you know, extending an under, right? Uh, this is more about the fact that you don't need to know that that extension exists. You can just type one, type dot, and suddenly you're gonna discover the capabilities of that object in that context, which is the key here, right? Uh, yeah, the syntax is super nice, like you just say uh, class dot, something, it looks like you're extending the class, you're not. This is just a normal function under the hood that takes the receiver as the first parameter. So again, magic, but not really magic. Um, yeah, and then a bit of a more complex example. And this is starting to show the power. Now I'll explain what it means. So, well, what a function does is easy. Um, you want to get something from a map. If it's not there, give me something else. Uh, let's just break down the different parts for a second. So you have the, the list of the generic type parameters, uh, like Java. Um, you declare that this works on any map. And also it's interesting to notice that this is map meaning a read-only map, potentially immutable. Uh, the, the difference is that you can declare also a mutable map in Kotlin, which means it's a map that you can actually change. Uh, and again, it's all a trick, because like the mutable map interface doesn't even exist. Under the hood, this is probably a hash map, so you can actually change it if you really want, but you declare the intent of not wanting to modify, or at least just read from it. So any map of these generic types k and v, and this is interesting because it means that any map will work, and k and v will be replaced by the actual types when you invoke this, right? Um, name of the function, then you start declaring the parameters, key. Default value is interesting because it has this weird signature. Now that's a lambda. It's a function, essentially, that takes no parameters and returns v. What's interesting about this is that, so this is the logic, so get the key from the map. Again, you just say get because this, like the context in which you're in, is the map. So it's almost like you're saying map.get, but you're already there as if you were extending the class, although, again, you're not. Uh, you get the key, if it's null, then give me the default value. The interesting part is that default value is not a value, it's a function. That means that it's gonna be lazily evaluated only when needed, so if, if it's expensive to create it, you're not gonna create it unless you need it. 
And it could also not be a value at all. You could throw an error inside that function, and either the value is there or it will blow up. You can do whatever you want because, again, it's a function. The last piece, super important, is that this is an inline function. Um, if you are developing for Android, you might really care about the, your method count and the garbage collector, how much pressure um, you put on it. And so you want to definitely avoid creating instances when you don't need to. What inline does is that it says, literally take whatever code you're putting into this default value and inline it in place when you're invoking a function. Um, this not only has the benefit uh, that you don't need to create the default value, it's like a, a fake function. It's not really a function, actually. Um, but it also has multiple advantages that we're going to see uh, later. Because you have like a compile time safety that things are going to be exactly how you specify. This cannot be anything. It's going to be exactly what you call it with. So yeah, that's it. Uh, another really nice feature, so um, imagine you have this network result class that only has three cases. It can be canceled, it can be a success or an error, where success takes a JSON and error takes an error. Um, notice how the object syntax in this case means it's a singleton, and it's not just a singleton. Um, an object is both a class and a, an instance of something. So you can check that uh, something is exactly this instance, and there can only be one, or it's the class of the canceled uh, class. And uh, when you actually try to do the, the switch statement, which is when uh, in Kotlin, you'll see that for the cancel, you don't need the is, which is the instance of in Java. So you can just say either it's exactly this instance and then do something, or if it's success, do something. If it's uh, error, do something. Notice how this smart cast kicks in again, and you can safely access JSON when you're sure that it's a success. You can safely access error when you're sure it's error. Everything is handled for you uh, by the compiler. But the problem with this, which is the same problem you have in Java, is that if you start having these mappings all over your code base, and then one day you decide to add one more case, it compiles just fine. And if you don't remember or you don't even know that this has been mapped somewhere else, at runtime, this is going to fail because it's going to, it's going to encounter a case that you didn't know about and it's going to explode. So the way the calling fixes it is really nice. You just change this to a seal class. And now with this, you don't need to declare the else anymore. So now if you add a new case, the code will literally not compile until you go back and handle every single case. And this is so useful. I, I cannot really uh, say this enough. Uh, it really changes the way you, you spread out the mappings throughout your code base. Because before, you would tend to keep everything in one place, which was not necessarily readable. Uh, and now you don't anymore. You can safely export this contract that things are only going to be these. And if I ever add anything, you're definitely going to know it. Imagine if you're creating a library with this. You would have to document the fact that you added a type, but uh, if your users just bump the version and don't read the documentation, they're going to have crashes just because. OK. Um, so why would you use Kotlin? Um, because again, like I'm, I'm going to tell you a secret, although it's not really a secret. Everything you can do in Kotlin, you can do in Java you can write by hand whatever you want in Java, right? So it's not about that necessarily. You can also say that everything you can do in Java, you can do in bytecode. And I mean, sure, like you could go full bytecode if you wanted to, but which one would you rather use? The one that is more readable and is safer? Uh, yeah. So again, Kotlin to me is not about being less verbose, because sure, that's nice. But that's not it. It's about high level abstractions that you could write by hand if you wanted to, but in this case, they're enforced by the compiler. There's plenty of examples. So, seal classes we've seen before. Uh, delegation is another thing baked into the language where um, you can have a class that delegates different interfaces to other instances. And again, you could do that in Java by hand, by proxying every single method. And again, it's not even about writing the boilerplate for that. It's about the fact that if you add a new method or you change the signature for something, you would have to remember that you delegated somewhere and you would have to go back and fix it. Otherwise, it would blow up a runtime. 
Here, it's all taken care of by the compiler, so you don't even have to think about it, and you can safely just you know, let it go. Um, you can do the same with properties, so you can delegate, or let's say encapsulate, your reading and writing logic into property delegates. So you have these constructs that know how to read and write something and expose it as if it was a property. So you just use it normally, but behind the scenes, you can do much, much, much more. Uh, I created um, an extension for, uh, if any of you do Android, for uh, reading uh, intents in a type safe manner, in the sense that uh, with intents, you just have this like key value store where you have to trust the fact that when you ask this key, you're gonna get this type, otherwise, eh, it's gonna blow up. In this case, you can declare the fact that you, you expect this to be with a certain type, and then you're just gonna read it and write it type safely, and it's just gonna work automatically. And you only need to write that code once, and then you can reuse it safely wherever you want, which is the key. And you can do amazing things with it. Um, you can have default methods and interfaces, which is something Java 8 finally introduced, but if you're using Kotlin, you can actually have it in Android on every Android version, while Java 8 support with this uh, for um, for, for Android is only uh, from 24 or something, yeah. So we call it, you can actually use it for real, not in five years. Uh, yeah, another thing that's super interesting, oh yeah, and default, default inter, uh, methods and interfaces allow you to have almost like a multiple inheritance sort of style where you can split your things and encapsulate them in these different interfaces and then create objects that or classes that compose these different things together, or delegate, or you know, it's much much nicer than you would ever do it in Java. And actually, it makes sense finally to use this pattern. Um, another kind is like you know when you have these APIs that you really need a class of something, and then it's perhaps generic over that class, but you really need the class. And passing the class manually, it's always a hassle because you need to specify the class. You need to, uh, you could even give the wrong class with, in regards with how you use it, right? Uh, one thing that you can do with inline functions is that you can declare some uh, generic types as um, reified. Reified means that uh, you're still gonna get type erasure at runtime, as usual, but if you ever say something like, give me the class of T, which is something that in Java fails, and in normal Kotlin also fails, uh, because it's reified, the compiler is gonna replace class of T with the real class of whatever you're using to invoke that function. So if you have an inline function where T in that case is a string, class of T is gonna be string. And so that allows you to avoid having to pass the class parameter mean many times, or worst case, you will have to put the class in the, how do you call them, the angle brackets, uh, without having to say even dot class. Something like some function, um, square uh, angle brackets, string, and that's it. Maybe you don't even have other parameters after that, and he already knows how to do things with that class, because he can extract it at compile time. Uh, another example, you know uh, marker interfaces, which is this thing in Java where you have like a dynamic context, and you don't really want to specify beforehand a real interface. So you just create this empty interface that is documentation to say, something is gonna be here, uh, at runtime, I'm actually gonna check if or when, blah, 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 this is useful. In Kotlin, if you use marker interfaces, they are actually useful, because you can create extensions over the marker interface. And now, the only way to access those extensions is by um, inheriting from that interface. So when you extend that interface, you finally gain access to this broader context where uh, your, your domain is you know, much uh, much more focused exactly on that. And you're not exposing those things in the global context, which is generally not what you want to do. Um, and again, like some things are possible in Java, because you could technically write anything in Java, but they're so cumbersome to, to create, to use, to maintain, that they're impractical and you're never gonna actually use it. Or your users are gonna misuse it, or you know, um, by having this, this enforced uh, patterns, calling really uh, makes it really nice, again, to, to be able to use good patterns. Uh, I would describe it as um, 
increasing the usability, discoverability, and readability of your APIs in ways that can only uh, make it better for you to use the code. Um, you can extend the language through DSLs, which are domain-specific languages. Uh, think of them as mini languages that carry your intent even more when you're doing something. Like, normally you want to just describe, I don't know, uh, a JSON file, right? And there's a lot of boilerplate in Java to do that. So you, perhaps just to declare that you want to add one thing, you have multiple lines declaring like do that, do that, do that. With a DSL, you could just describe in one line what you want, and that's specific to your domain. And again, users, like programmers that don't know the API, they just go into DSL, the DSL and just, they can only do what they can. So when you start doing the uh, code completion, they will see exactly what's available. And it's almost like a self-documenting code in a way. Um, it really makes it not just nice to look at but, and extremely expressive, but you cannot shoot yourself in the foot if you design the API as well through this. Uh, one thing that we started doing lately is this like smart configuration. So often you have like a list of constants and you want to declare the constants, but at the same time you want to know all the constants. So you would have a list somewhere where you manually add all the constants to the list. What you can do in Kotlin is to have an object that extends some base abstract class that you create specifically for this. And then every time you add a constant, you add it either with a property delegate or passing through a function, and that automatically initializes the constant in some way perhaps, adds it to the overall list in another way, or does whatever sort of tricks. It can even extract the name of the constant somehow from the name of the variable, which is super useful. Um, this way, you just have the same list of constants, except it's way more than that. It's also uh, you know, like an actual list. Uh, you can do stuff on the object, like your imagination is the limit, I would say. Um, yeah, so self-documenting with low or no ceremony over just describing your intent instead of having to go low level to try to describe it. It's probably the first programming language built in symbiosis with tools. Well, you know why, because JetBrains. And what this means for you is that the compiler and the IDE are often very blurred. Like there's a very blurry line between them. For the first time, they are creating something that is meant to be used in an IDE. And every time they add any new feature, they think about the IDE first, in a way. Um, like a good example of how this can help is in Scala, you have macros, which are super powerful and amazing, etc. The problem with macros is that um, you don't know what they're going to generate until you actually run them, right? So you have to compile the entire thing just to know the output of that macro. And that's a problem for the IDE, because the IDE has no idea what to do before you run everything. And so in the Scala community, the, the de facto uh, convention now is to create a macro and at the same time create an IDE plugin that does the exact same thing just to show you in real time what's going to happen, right? Although it's fake, because then you're still going to compile it through the macro, so it's a mess. The direction they want to move in is that there's no distinction between a, a macro, which they're going to call a compiler plugin, and the IDE integration. So it's all going to be incremental out of the box. Uh, you're going to see feedback in real time out of the box. It's meant to be used like that. Um, also something that if you come from Java, you'll probably be amazed of is that this is moving really fast. Like if you compare the, the life cycle of a Java release, this is unbelievably fast. Um, at the same time, though, it's very careful the way they are moving. So, for example, they, they often release features that are limited when they are not sure about the edge cases or side effects that they might have. And then, perhaps, if necessary, relax the restrictions later, instead of doing the opposite, where you can do anything and then suddenly you can't do it anymore, which is the worst. Uh, if they break anything, uh, feature-wise, they, they provide always painless migrations through the IDE, which is another great advantage they have by controlling the entire stack. And they are really, really thinking carefully about not bloating the language with uh, unneeded features, essentially. Um, yeah, and even, even a bit too carefully at times, because th there are things they really want in the language, and they're like, ah, we'll see. So, but all in all, what Colin gives you is a change of mindset. So, 
when you start being proficient in Kotlin and start really getting it, you go back to Java maybe for whatever reason and you just, you, the Java code you write after is different because somehow writing in Kotlin makes you a better programmer, which is so fascinating to me, but it just happens. Uh, you, you start asking questions like, if I can't do that easily, maybe I shouldn't do it. Uh, because again, the language is made so that you don't shoot yourself in the foot. So if you're trying to force it too much, maybe it's a bad idea. Uh, it makes you want to encapsulate rules all the time. So instead of doing things, let's say, manually all the time, you just encapsulate that into whatever structure that allows you to reuse it everywhere. And it's for free, and it's very easy to do once you get the hang of it. Um, plus the fact that you can use functional constructs a lot. Uh, again, changes your mindset in, in a good way. And yeah, there are some myths about Kotlin. For example, the, the biggest one I always hear is it's slow to compile. That was true at some point in the past. It's definitely not anymore. And even then, it was never as low as, say, Scala, for example. Uh, at times, for us, this is faster to compile than Java, which is interesting, because like, again, they, they're moving towards incremental everything. Uh, they're very optimizing specific scenarios. And the IDE even helps them, because normally a compiler only runs when you hit play, right? But if you have an IDE integration, every single part of the compilation pipeline can be optimized to, be, to only run based on exactly what changed, like the specific piece you changed, only that will be recompiled. And so the IDE even helps the compiler to understand exactly how this goes back and forth. Um, and I'm, I'm sure like, we're gonna see, seriously, like real-time compilation behind the scenes more and more, just it's gonna be even better, essentially. Another thing I heard is it might have a runtime overhead. That's absolutely not true. Like, it has the same overhead that it would have if you wrote the same things by hand in Java. So it's statically compiled. There's no dynamic invocation of any sorts. Uh, think of it as if it was Java code running, although it's more optimized than that. There are times, thanks to inlining stuff, that this is even faster than Java. Um, there's a benchmark called Reactive Scrabble that um, I think the, the guy from Rx did, I'm not sure. Uh, it showed that Kotlin is actually the fastest at doing single threaded computation because of inline. Because it's literally like, you know, writing imperative code by hand uh, instead of using a functional style, although in Kotlin it looks like a functional style. Uh, the learning curve is also not an issue, at least so far that we've been seeing. You can learn Kotlin in half or one day, just, you know, the rules. You can write Java in Kotlin for the first few weeks, because that's how it's going to be. You're just going to write shorter Java. And then after a while, piece by piece, you're going to have these like, enlightenment moments when this feature finally makes sense to you, or this pattern is finally idiomatic, blah, blah, blah. And in the end, you reach this like, nirvana of Kotlin, where it's like, oh my god, I finally get it. So that's really good. Um, yeah, I've heard that like. When, when I read Kotlin code, I'm not entirely sure what's going on all the time. So, A, you can always step in, into the code, always. So you can always see exactly what's happening. Um, you, when, when you're writing the code, you can decide to be explicit whenever needed. You can say, instead of inferring the type here, I want to specify it explicitly, why not? Or um, a thing we use a lot is parameter names. You can call functions by uh, passing the name of every parameter, and that's, amazing for readability, because you can't be mistaken over what you're writing. And especially in, in times where, I don't know, you have three parameters and they're all integers, you could easily you know, exchange them. But if you name them, then you can't do it wrong. I mean, you still can, but it's different. Um, yeah, and, and in general, like if the code works and whoever created it thought that it's readable enough, perhaps, it really doesn't matter if you don't understand exactly everything that's going on. Like, again, this is about higher level abstraction. So the thing you're going to see most likely is just describing a very high level intent. What's going inside perhaps needs more investigation, but maybe not. Uh, and sort of related that it can be confusing uh, to read without an IDE. Like if you're doing pull requests in GitHub and the, all the types are inferred, maybe you're not sure exactly what type is where. So 
It's true. That's that's a valid point. Um, so far, it hasn't been a problem for us, honestly. You can read the imports often where you're not sure, and they're going to tell you what this extension is. Or in general, if the type are not explicit, it probably means they don't matter because it just flows from one type to the other. And if the code compiles, it's generally OK. Um, and another thing that's actually true is that finding classes is a bit harder in, in GitHub because in the ID is super fast because it's not a one on one mapping anymore between a file in a package and the actual class. Now classes can be anywhere in any file, in any package. Um, that's true. And uh, it's something that I hope GitHub will actually improve because they could do it, have like a fine class. Um, yeah. So this brings us to the cons. Uh, there are some occasional rough edges around the tooling. Can't avoid it, like weird errors or incompatibilities. For example, the, a good example is data binding. It was broken for the longest time. Um, but it's getting better and better. And still, like it's super worth it regardless. Huh? Room, yeah, still ish. But still, it, it often happens that if something is not designed with quality in mind from the ground up, um, things get lost into translation. So if you use annotation processing, uh, the Kotlin types will be dumped down to Java types. So you're going to lose all the nullability, uh, list versus uh, mutable list. Like You're going to lose all of that, and it's going to look like Java in the end. So there are places where you would like that to be different. But again, the ecosystem is designed around Java, so it's going to take some time until all the tools adapt to also you know, include Kotlin. It generally works out of the box, but if you want to do very advanced stuff that is only possible in Kotlin, you might lose it when you move to a different step of the pipeline, which is fair enough, I guess. And this is really a, a huge con. You're not going to be able to go back to Java ever. Because once you, like Java has never felt dumber than before, now you really see that there is a difference, that there's a, an alternative, and it's really, really pleasurable to use. Uh, luckily, with what happened with Google and Android, I think we're going to see more and more jobs where you can just be Kotlin 100%. Um, yeah, so this is today. All right, and it's already amazing, but there's more coming and it's really exciting. Uh, so uh, just random features um, that I'm excited about personally. Immutable collections, which are actually, actually gonna be persistent collections. Uh, <clears throat> they're gonna be added to, not to the standard library, but as a separate thing uh, maintained by JetBrains. Um, and so they will allow you to use your um, immutability even further, because then you can keep everything uh, without copying it around, it's really great. Universal serialization is amazing. So it's not like a, a new serialization format or anything. It's actually the opposite. They will allow any Kotlin construct object to be converted to and from any format you want. XML, JSON, parcelable, you name it. It's going to be entirely customizable and embedded into the language. And I cannot wait for this. This is going to be really huge. Type classes is another thing. Type classes are when you essentially say, like, this is an int, but don't use it as an int. Use it as a different class. So wherever you would expect an int, you can't pass just a normal number. It has to be, let's say, created or casted to that specific type. Otherwise, you can't use it. And so this is amazing for when you have, again, a name, address, email, three parameters. They're all strings. You could easily swap them, right? But if you make them type classes, you can't. It becomes type safe. And you will have all the benefits of having um, essentially the best performance, like primitive types, but using them as classes. Now, this, it's, they're still debating how to do this exactly, because it can be done fully at compile time as just an analysis of how you use the types. But they're waiting for uh, Project Valhalla in Java 10, which is going to have that uh, inside the JVM. So I'm sure they're going to do that as well, but they're also going to backport it to everybody else. Can't wait for that. Um, not, um, not libraries or, feature, or yeah, features of the language, but something even more exciting is multi-platform support. So multi-platform is, is actually a core principle of the language. They, it's not like they came up with the idea of, oh, OK, now we're also going to support something. No. Since the beginning, they, they really wanted to be able to create a language that is platform agnostic. Sure, it has to be fully compatible with JVM, yes. But at the same time, they wanted 
to be able to run everywhere. So right now, it already runs perfectly on JavaScript. And they are doing Kotlin native, which is going to be able to make it run on any binary uh, compatible device. So be it like uh, an embedded device, iOS, you name it. Um, super interesting is that they actually have a pluggable memory management system. So even the memory management in the native one is going to be different depending on the platform. It's probably going to be automatic reference counting on iOS, but maybe it's going to be a garbage collector on Linux or something. So it's really well thought. And we, so um, the way it's done is that you will have one shared module, which is pure Kotlin. It doesn't depend on any platform. And you write most of your business logic there, right? And then you actually have one project per platform that uses that as a library of sorts and actually adds more to it potentially. Or you can have these functions that are just signatures. So they are like not real functions. You just declare that you need that function. And then every platform will implement it in the way that makes sense for the platform, which is a very smart way to, to do the shared code approach. Um, and at Clue, we are actually already doing it. We, we created our core algorithm originally in JavaScript, and now we fully converted it to Kotlin, and we're shipping it as the JVM version on Android, and as the JavaScript version on iOS and on the backend. And when Kotlin Native is gonna be available, which is in tech preview right now, by the way, we're also gonna have that directly on iOS. So, and it's working super, super well. Yeah, it's like, like just one or two order of magnitudes faster than before, which is nice. Yeah, and then finally the, the last step, well, the next step at least, in the evolution of Kotlin is proper metaprogramming support. Now, you can use annotation processing, as I said, and um, soon I'm gonna release a, a library, let's say, that will allow you to, to extract Kotlin types during annotation processing, which is already huge if you want to make tools that, again, work with Kotlin in mind. But what they want to do is to release this compiler plugin API, which is hooks into the compilation process that allow you to analyze anything you want and change anything you want. So think a hybrid of annotation processing and bytecode manipulation at the compiler level. So you will directly have access to the constructs of the compilation at various steps in the pipeline and be able to change them at will, which is what they are already doing. They already release some compiler plugins. And technically, you can write a compiler plugin today. I, I release a super small sample on GitHub. But A, it's not documented in any way, so you would have to reverse engineer the API. And it's going to change. It's going to change a lot in the next year, at least. So you will probably have to reverse engineer it multiple times a year, which is maybe not what you want to do. Um, but I really hope it comes soon. It's going to have, obviously, as I said, IDE support out of the box, incremental compilation support out of the box. So it's going to be like made to work um, with the compiler, right? And yeah, uh, the, the reason why it's still so far away is that the compiler originally was created by taking a piece of the engine of IntelliJ, which has this amazing engine for analyzing the source code of stuff, of anything. And they realized that, that's, that that works right now, but it's not as fast as it could be. So they're making it uh, hugely optimized and moving to a different architecture. And that is going to take at least a year. So that's why we're still waiting. OK, so these are some links for you. Um, if you know Kotlin already, probably the only interesting ones are the last two, especially the future of Kotlin, which is a video from um, Andre Blaslav, the creator of the language. And it's really interesting. You should totally watch it. Uh, yeah, so that's me. And you can find a link uh, to the slides here. So follow me on Twitter, at WorkingKills. Ah, you can see it on the projector, yeah. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. And uh, we have stickers, so come to me after. And yes. Hello. Hi. Thanks for the talk. Uh, well, the problem is that all sounds uh, really awesome, uh, all that fancy stuff. But uh, imagine there, is a, there are plenty of, um, I don't know, ORM solutions or whatever libraries that rely heavily on the Java runtime. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you, of course, you have legacy and you have yeah. a project that uses uh, use that library. 
and so on. And then you come up with the idea, that, wow, that's Kotlin, let's use it because mm -hmm. it's awesome and uh, efficient and so on. But you stru uh, stuck with that problem that uh, some runtime just doesn't work with Kotlin yet. And you just can't, can't do anything like uh, reading a half of your app in Kotlin and another thing in Java is not very like supportable or yeah. convenient or it goes against the practice that every piece of your project should be indistinguishable uh, according to the person who, who writes that. So how are we going to manage that? So do you, do you have a concrete example of something? Yeah, yeah, working? of course. So yeah. we have actually uh, an application that uses GreenDAO yeah. uh, for, for ORM in Android. And GreenDAO doesn't support the, the Kotlin, actually. Really? And, the, and they have, uh, they have a, a ticket in their GitHub, right. like, like, let's support Kotlin. And they're like, yeah, we will return that in time. And, yeah, I and see. That's all. And we would like. Just, we are have done. you have you tried lately? Because they improved the annotation processing support a lot lately. Uh, sorry. What, so what, what, you should try again now because they improved it a lot lately. Okay. So that's one. And also yes. So that can happen now. It's gonna go away a lot. Like now that Google announced that it's officially supported, every tool out there is gonna be absolutely compatible with Kotlin, or nobody's gonna use it essentially. So. Okay. So so we are just hoping for for the best. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's weird that it doesn't work because I don't know of a tool right now that like everything we use works perfectly with Kotlin. Like, there's okay. no issue whatsoever. Maybe I was just unlucky. <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely, definitely, yes. Uh, thanks. Same thing. Same thing. Same thing.